Hello, welcome back to the show. Today we have a returning guest, Benjamin Studebaker. I read his credentials out last time and took up uh, quite a bit of time doing that, so I'm not going to do it again. You could look at the older video if you want to get those or refer to the show notes. I'll have them in there again. So welcome back on the show. And what do you want me to call you, Benjamin, Ben? Are there any uh, honorifics you want me to throw in there? Nah, I'm not too fussed about it. Call me whatever feels right to you. All right. Uh, so you wrote a few essays that came out in a pamphlet, I believe, put out by the Platypus Society. Yeah, they were uh, in Sublation. Yeah, Sublation Media. They're, okay, so Sublation Media put them out, and they're on the topic of revolutionary subjectivity or the revolutionary subject. And I think they offer a really good... Uh, balance to what we talked about on the last video, which was your book about American democracy, because in that you seem to be looking more at some of the objective situations. Uh, and in this one, obviously, you're looking at the other side of that. Uh, what motivated you to focus on it uh, for, sorry, to focus on subjectivity more for these pieces? Well, I think anytime you get frustrated with electoralism or with the democratic system, after having spent some time putzing around with that, you flip and you look at the revolutionary side of it. And then when people get frustrated with the revolutionary side of it, they flip and, and look back at the uh, democratic and electoral side of it. And that's something that I'm conscious of. This is a tendency for people in the left to do. We spend some time thinking about one thing, we get tired of it, and then we, we flip. So I, I did my flip, and this is my version of doing the flip. Got it. So, yeah, I actually uh, pay a lot of attention to this topic. I did, uh, uh, I was on a celebration media show with Doug talking about the revolutionary subject and Marcuse and Heidegger and all that. And, um, you know, it's long been the driving force in what I research is trying to get to the more subjective aspects of this situation. Uh, but before we really dive into this, I want to just clarify some things. Are we talking about the revolutionary subject in history, quote unquote, or are we talking about revolutionary subjectivity itself or some kind of combo? How would you define what we're talking about? Well, I think that these two discussions have to be treated as related, right? Because the person who can actually carry out the revolution uh, is you know, or it has to be the revolutionary subject in history. If theories that are based on there being a particular revolutionary subject are to be regarded as valid, right? So yeah. part of my exploring different theories that try to pinpoint this or that as the subject of history uh, is, to, is to say, well, can they actually be the revolutionary subject? You know, what would be the steps that you would take to actually bring about that state of mind in a person from that background? instead of just assuming that that state of mind inevitably will come about or will be brought about through a historical process. Okay. And just to give everyone the title of the book, it's called Four Essays on the Revolutionary Subject. So I think what I want to do is go through, you know, each essay in turn, talk about each one of them a little bit, and then, uh, then we could open it up and, you know, talk about some of the gaps or whatever you want to call them, uh, things that you're still thinking about, open-ended ideas you have. So the first essay is called Revolution Without the Risks, Enjoying the Adventures of Yevene uh, Prigazin, who, uh, well, I won't summarize it. I'll let you give a summary of what the essay is about and why you chose him as the uh, the figure that you're you're using to talk about this? Yeah, a little while back there was this you know, incident where Yevgeny Prigozhin, the a commander of of the Wagner Group, the mercenary group uh, underneath, or maybe or maybe not underneath the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, took his his forces and tried to lead them on a march to Moscow. And this caused a bunch of people online to think, maybe this is the end of the Putin regime. Maybe everybody's going to defect over to Prigozhin and it's going to result in the collapse. 
And so you had a lot of people on Twitter who were very, very excited about it. A lot of people online who were very excited about it. And this piece is about that reaction and uh, what that reaction indicates or shows about Westerners, uh, Western commentators. A lot of these pieces are about spectators and spectating this wanting in some way to participate in a revolution, but not wanting to really participate in it in such a way that you'd personally be at risk. So these attempts to kind of participate in it by proxy, by identifying with or cheering on from the stands, somebody that you've projected these qualities onto. And in the case of Prigozhin, it was especially interesting because Prigozhin has none of the qualities that these people would typically like or value in a person. And it was really easy to find out that he didn't have these qualities. You could just go on Wikipedia and you'd find out that he had been Putin's chef, that he'd been friends with everybody in Putin's inner circle, you know, that this is a, an inner circle guy. So it's not like he was some kind of harbinger of liberalism or leftism or anything else. And yet he was being treated this way because there's this fantasy that you know, it's still possible for someone somewhere in the world, not here, but somewhere else, to do something exciting that could have positive results. So I think that this is a good opening essay because so, this really relates to something that, you know, we've been seeing in left-wing politics, at least since, uh, you know, the Maoist little red book in the 60s and all that third worldist uh, mentality became, you know, uh, basically the counterculture's mode of doing leftism. And um, what do you think, I know you, we spent a lot of time talking about objectively, you know, why it's so difficult to imagine a revolution in the United States, but what do you think drives people to ignore some of the details that would, uh, you know, make them doubt that this is really the kind of revolution they're looking for uh, and so on and so forth? Well, because they don't have to actually participate in it, they don't have to think about it in that kind of rigorous way because their lives aren't in danger if it doesn't go well. You know, people have to think very seriously about revolutions if they're going to actually participate in them. But if you're spectating and you're spectating from a safe country, a country that is uh, you know, indifferent to or actively encouraging the ostensibly revolutionary actor, then if anything, your praise for the revolutionary figure becomes praiseworthy. It becomes something that might be an asset to you in your social circles or in your career. So from a personal interest standpoint, people have nothing to lose and everything to gain from engaging in the spectatorship without thinking too much about it. Thinking too much about it could cause them to take a position that wouldn't be cool or might seem like a Debbie Downer uh, kind of view among their friends. And that's the real situation they're in. They're with their friends in the stands. And if you're you know, at a game with your friends in the stands, you go, oh, you know, sports are you know, really part of ideology. And you know, I, I don't like dunks because you know, that's not you know, how you're actually supposed to play. And you know, nobody wants to sit with somebody who talks like that. I want to come back around to the, the, um, the way that peer groups impact a lot of this stuff later. So I'm going to put a note down just to remember that because you didn't get too into that, but I think it's really important. Um, something with, uh, with this essay is um, what do you think the impact is of having this kind of uh, – uh, an overexcited and, um, you know, superficial reading of conflict situations is uh, on the left, you know, as it, as things become clarified, as things move forward and uh, aren't so such a hot topic anymore. Yeah, as you say, this has been going on since the 60s. And I think it's been getting worse and worse as the conflicts have been increasingly not really left, right, ideological conflicts. There, there aren't communists or anarchists or socialists on either side of these conflicts anymore. Uh, but even back then in the 60s, you know, a big part of the interest in those third world revolts was this sense that, well, we couldn't do it here, so maybe they can do it there. Maybe it's still possible to do things there that we can't do here. Maybe there's something special about the colonial subject you know, because they have this uh, experience of colonization that they can somehow uh, do things that are not thinkable for us. 
And therefore, even if we can't understand the, the subjective position, we have to find a way to sympathize with it or empathize with it. I think we see this uh, you know, in relation to the Iranian revolution, a lot of people on the left in the 70s trying to find a way to sympathize with it. It comes from this sense that you can't do anything in the West. Uh, and this has only gotten more and more ridiculous as time has passed and these revolutions become more and more pseudo revolutions, simulations of revolutions, not you know, proper uh, you know, conflicts where there's even a left-wing faction involved in the first instance. I think the Iranian revolution is the first really clear-cut example of nobody involved is on the left, and yet you're going to find left-wing people trying to find a way to sympathize with the revolution just, just to try to reintroduce the possibility of action, of some kind of, of action coming in a seemingly bottom-up way. Uh, and I think that uh, this becomes really functional for the establishment because it means that you can get the left to cheer on revolutions that are just about spreading the uh, capital mobility and the capitalist system to more parts of the world, to the you know parts of the world that are holdouts. Yeah, I also, I would just add to that. I think it also leads to massive embar embarrassments. I mean, I know Noam Chomsky will, you know, get shit all the way to today about his support for the Khmer Rouge and, there's a lot of, you know, every time the right wing really wants to uh, dig into the left and cut them down, I think all they have to do is look at these <laughs> these past examples of support for what become authoritarian regimes and uh, just say, look at what this these idiots supported. Um, so I think there's a lot more to talk about with the other essays, at least uh uh, as far as what I've studied and read about. So uh, is there anything else you want to talk about for this one before we move on? Because I think there's some juicy stuff later. Yeah, the Purgosian essay is really the introductory essay to this thing. And it's really about just getting across this idea that you know we aren't really serious about revolution, even though we act as if we are, we talk as if we are. We're really not serious about it in a quite fundamental sense. And that is the background condition that is there and operating in all the other essays. Okay, cool. So the next one is called Citizen Eject. And this is something I've never thought about at all, which is this, uh, I guess, this uh, situation internationally where people are, there's a big debate about denationalizing de citizens. Can you like just explain what that situation is so that we could talk about the consequences philosophically? Yeah, so denationalization is something some states will do to a person who commits a terrorist act uh, or is uh, accused or convicted of, of committing a terrorist act. So if you are convicted of a terrorist act, in some states, you can have your citizenship taken away from you. And there are arguments about whether this is something that should be possible in all situations or only for dual citizens. So, for instance, if you had, say, dual uh, British and uh, Iranian citizenship and you commit a terrorist act, you might be stripped of your British citizenship and then sent to Iran. Uh, you know, this is something that has happened, especially uh, recently with migrants uh, who have pe people who have immigrated to say the UK or Australia from Muslim countries and then become involved with say the Islamic State. Uh, maybe they've gone to Syria and participated in some way and then they try to come back and instead of just prosecuting them through the ordinary legal system, an effort is made to take the citizenship away. And is that something that's happened much in the United States or is this mostly a European phenomenon? It's uh, more common in the UK and in Australia than in the States at this point. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I, don't think, I don't think the States is doing it. I could be wrong about that. I'd have to check. Yeah, I, nothing immediately comes to mind. I'd have to check too. Um, so I feel like this essay really ties back into your last book in a strong way because we're back at this concept of the legitimacy of the state or citizenship which is kind of a uh, uh, branches off of that in a very direct way. And uh, you, you present 
two or three different kind of basic ideas of what the point of citizenship is and what its basis uh, rests on. Um, will you just elaborate a little bit on what those different forms are, the transactional versus the uh, the Althusser kind of view? Yeah, so transactional citizenship involves, you know, you receive the rights of citizenship and in exchange you perform various duties associated with it, right? And if you don't perform the duties, well, some theorists will go, well, then you shouldn't get the rights, right? That makes sense. And it does make sense if you conceptualize citizenship in that way. Of course, most of the time when people don't follow the duties of citizenship, we don't take away their citizenship. We uh, convict them of a crime and put them in prison or something like that, right? But these theorists go, well, why should you even bother with that? Uh, you know, there's a, a guy, Jopke, who makes the argument, you know, it is a transaction, isn't it? So if you don't uh, do your duties, why should you get the rights? And it's very difficult for liberal political theorists to explain why this doesn't work. I think that there's a lot more basis for making a counter argument if you understand citizenship in a constitutive way. So constitutive citizenship understands citizens as meaningfully and significantly constituted by the states in which they live, right? So Althusser makes this argument that states constitute subjects in such a way that the subjects think they've freely chosen to affirm the state and to follow its laws. So they think that the state's values are their values because they've been constituted in such a way that they think they've freely chosen to affirm the state's values, right? And if the state is able to do something like that, then what, if you have someone who's a terrorist who isn't affirming the state's values, doesn't that mean the state has failed to constitute them in the appropriate way? And if the state is going to usurp or, or assume the right, depending on how you think about it, uh, to constitute its citizens, to, to decide how they're going to think about the world and shape them through control of the culture industry and the economy and, and the institutions, the schools and, and, and religion and all of that, the state's gonna take that kind of really big commanding role in society. Shouldn't it bear responsibility for the way its citizens turn out? Well, the state wants to assert that it has uh, you know, the right to constitute its, its citizens in all of these ways, while at the same time denying it. And that's part of how that constitution comes off, to make the citizen believe that they really freely chose to believe what the state wants them to believe. Uh, you have to pretend as if you didn't constitute them. Uh, that's part of making that illusion work. So part of how the state does this is by pretending that citizenship is transactional, that you make some kind of deal with the state as if you stood outside it as an as a individual in a Habesian or Lockean sense who's pre-political. You just make some sort of handshake agreement with the state that you're gonna follow the duties in exchange for the rights. So this is, I mean, the transactional view is clearly, uh, you know, a the sort of common sense of the liberal thinking that we're used to dealing with in the United States. And, you know, outside of this, the idea of citizenship, we're talking about, you know, the contract between employee and employer and things like that, where the uh, people are taken in as individuals and uh, assumed to be these free agents, uh, basically on equal footing that can negotiate this kind of agreement, you're kind of getting the same idea with uh, the citizen and the state, right? Where it's a, uh, a market of states almost. But I don't know if they quite get there. It seems like that's where they're going. Um, the thing that I think is a little bit more complicated, at least from the starting point that we you know, arrive at these questions at is the Althusserian or you know, some of the other thinkers, this more collective view and this constitutive view of the state. And one thing I thought was interesting, you quoted Althusser uh, discussing different state apparatuses. And uh, in general, I'd like you to talk about why he, what that is. And just personally, I, I'm curious about like, why does he include unions in that list? But um, yeah, let's definitely, you know, what is, what, how does not being an individualist change this a little bit? And how do we get to these like ideas of the constitutive state? 
Yeah, so Althusser is writing in a post-war French context, and he's thinking about these you know, very unitary, very centralized European states of the post-war era, where it seems as if the state has its hands in even stuff that we would think of as private or part of society, right? Or that at this point, society and the state are so mutually enmeshed that you can't meaningfully take them apart. So for, and I think you could push back against that and say it's a bit too top down, especially if you were to apply it straightforwardly in other situations and other contexts that don't look like post-war France. I think that's the, the vulnerability in the argument is that it's too top down and too shaped by this post-war moment that we maybe are no longer in or we're only very briefly in. But it's a, a kind of, of taking this idea of, okay, what emerged in the 30s and 40s and 50s are these total societies, right? Where the, these totalitarian states that have completely rooted all the way into society. And so even the parts of society that you think of as sites of resistance have actually been co-opted by this system. And indeed, people made these arguments about the unions in the West all the time, that the unions had been co-opted by the capitalist state and had just become part of the corporatist uh, structure. Uh, and people made the, make these arguments about religion, especially in states where there is very heavy regulation of churches like Germany and, and France you know, with the enforced secularism in Germany where the religions are actually funded by the state uh, and therefore have to follow certain rules to be able to continue to receive funding. Uh, so in these kinds of states where the state is very heavily involved in the management of culture, and, and you could think about this even back to say the Kulturkampf in uh, you know, Bismarck's Germany, these very purposeful direct interventions in the culture by the state, uh, in these kinds of states, it becomes harder to argue that there really is a meaningful private sector, private sphere, society that's freestanding, that's external to the state. And because the state has rooted to that degree, for Althusser, you have to think about these things in a much more organic way. Uh, and that produces a very different understanding of citizenship than we get in these earlier contexts where it seems more obvious to people that the state is limited in its reach and that there is some private uh, or social sphere that's external to the state in, say, the 19th century. Okay. So what? So one of the things that you bring in up early in the essay is how dual, dual citizenship creates a huge problem um when talking about this because i think i think it does in both cases the transactional and the constitutive um because it makes excuses for states to denationalize citizens or what exact why is dual citizenship a problem so dual citizenship makes it unclear which state do you owe duties to or if you owe duties to both states, what do you do if those duties conflict, right? And on the constitutive account, well, which is the state that actually constituted you, right? If you have two citizenships, say you were born in Iran, but then you moved to uh, Britain and you've grown up in Britain, you went to British schools, you've lived in Britain your whole life. Well, it would seem clear that Britain is the state that constituted you. But if the British state can say, once you have gone and done terrorist acts, oh no, you're not British. You're really Iranian, let's send you back to Iran. Uh, then it can disavow its role in constituting you. And um, so another thing that this relates to, I mentioned just the basic legitimacy of the state, and whether you think about it as a constituting force or, you know, just this chosen contract that society enters into. The other, uh, another way that this same problem comes up is with voting, right? And universal suffrage and the history of who has the right to be enfranchised with the vote. And um, I think we get a lot more clarity, not more clarity, but we get extra clarity when we include that in this discussion, because they a lot of people were really straightforward about property being a uh basically your investment in the state and therefore only property owners should have the right to vote and then as time has gone on and the suffrage movements have included different classes different races different 
genders, we saw that change. What can we, is there a history of this when it comes to citizenship as well? Or has this been more of a uh, sort of unex- unexamined, unchanging aspect of liberalism that is now recently being thrown into question? I think this is a good point. When you make citizenship something that everybody has in the society, uh, both in you know, just by default, everybody has citizenship, and then also everybody has the same citizenship rights because you have some kind of formal liberal legal equality, it becomes uh, more difficult for the state to parse these distinctions by uh, putting people in different political uh, stratus, uh, strati, right? In ancient societies, only a small part of the citizen popu- of the population has citizenship, and the rest have a different political status. And those different political statuses result in different treatment straightforwardly by the state. You know, in Roman law, certain punishments are only acceptable uh, for non-citizens. You would never uh, do certain kinds of things to a citizen. Uh, and, and that inequality is baked into the system, right? Uh, so you can be a subject of a state without being a citizen of that state. And, and the subject and citizen uh, classes are separate and distinct. In liberal states, these things get put together. So the citizens have less positive influence within the state. Uh, so they're, the sense in which their citizens is dulled. But also, they have this ostensible latent capacity to act that they're always accused of not using or not using properly or not using enough, Right. Uh, So they can't just be treated as subjects. So if you try to say, well, I'm a subject, I'm not really in charge here, treat me like a subject, the state will selectively go, oh, no, you're a citizen, you have to do these things, right? And then in other situations where you go, well, I'm a citizen, I should get this stuff, right? The state goes, well, no, you're a subject, you don't get to make decisions about that. Uh, There's a a playing back and forth. And this is where I bring in Etienne Balabar, who I think has done some really interesting work. He's, of course, in that Altusarian genus. But he, he kind of talks about this uh, citizen subject. This, if you try to describe someone as a citizen, eventually you'll have to acknowledge the respects in which they're a subject, where, that they don't really live up to this idea of citizenship. And at the same time, if you talk about someone as a subject, then this citizenship aspect uh, you know, doesn't really come into play. And Balabar makes the interesting point that the people who most realize the citizen side, the people who do things that defy their constitution by the state, are criminals and terrorists and revolutionary figures. So these are the people who are the most citizens because they're the ones who think for themselves aren't just constituted purely in the way that subjects are constituted purely. They engage in some kind of agentic behavior, right? But of course, if you take that kind of argument, then the people who are the most subject are often the people we would think of as the most citizen. They're the people who follow all of the structural incentives to climb up the greasy pole and get promotions. They're the people who actually get elected to offices and who become uh, members of uh, boards of companies. These are people who follow all of the structural incentives and, and comply with all of them. So they're people who are really totally subjects, but they're the ones that are framed as the most citizen and as, ha- and as having the most agency. They're the theoretically powerful people in the capitalist uh, system. And the people who have the least power are, are for Balabar, the, those who have the greatest level of citizenship. So I say, in some ways, this argument, you know, the Balabar argument, could rationalize the denationalization on the basis that you know, uh, these people who are citizens are the most free because they're free individuals. Uh, but a, an alternative position would be to say, well, it, it's not that they're free individuals, it's that the state has misconstituted them and is responsible for the way they've turned out. So I would love to read more of his stuff. And I I have never heard the name until I read your book. So I looked him up and found out that he is still very much alive, first of all. Uh, he also participates in uh, Bernard Harcourt's 1313 lectures. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but... They're a very good ongoing series of lectures that uh, deal with all all these topics, basically, that we're talking about. And um, so I just want to point that out to people, because a lot of the time we're talking about the dead white men, and we're not talking about the alive white men. And uh, this time we are. But um, anyway, sorry not to throw you too much off track. There are so many counterintuitive things that 
uh, you get when you start asking this question. For example, like you just said, you know, if you start to say, well, the highest functionaries within the state are really the ones that are most subject to it and therefore uh, really don't model the liberal idea of citizenship as, a, as an active participant in this sort of democratic sense, uh, you know, it might not be such a good thing to just automatically give everybody citizenship, which, um, you know, I, I have questioned this for a long time. It seems to me that being automatically claimed by the state might not necessarily be in our best interest if we ever plan to change the state. And this, you know, leads into the question, so how does this impact revolutionary thinking, revolutionary subjectivity, and things like that? Yeah. So Balabar argues that ultimately, if you engage in the revolutionary behavior, then you fully realize the citizen side. And so insofar as revolutionary activity is possible, it's still possible for this citizen side to be realized. But since this now happens in defiance of the way that we're constituted, rather than uh, through our, our constitution as citizens, uh, it now happens in this, in this criminal space. It happens in this very, uh, uh, in this shrinking and fragile space. And it also happens in a space that uh, most people regard as, as very icky and not something that they want to endorse or be part of or participate in themselves. So the other thing that gets a little confusing with this is we kind of get a shift in what we mean when we say subject, right? Because at the beginning, when we say the revolutionary subject of history, we're talking about the agent. We're talking about a, a, the people who are most capable of a revolution and things like that. But then when we get to this stuff about nationalization and denationalization, we're getting more of like the Foucault subjectivization or like, you know, you are sort of like a, uh, you're being constituted and you're being constituted is sort of the basis of subjectivity. And yeah, uh, how can, can you help explain why this happens, how we get this shift in meaning with the term subject when we, when we start doing this? I think a, a lot of theorists have, in recent decades, become very focused on agency because it doesn't seem like we have any anymore. And so there's this constant quest to try to find where it still is. And a lot of this is an attempt to deal with the kinds of arguments that are raised by Althusser and Foucault, who are different from each other. Uh, but I think you're right to point out that both of these arguments do lead to a view where you can't really escape the power. The power is always there. It's always, you're always subject to it. Uh, and the, you know, the objection that is often raised to both of those theorists is, well, how do you get out of it then? Uh, and this is a real question. How do you get out of it? Uh, Balabar goes, well, uh, terrorists get out of it, but you don't have to be a violent terrorist. Balabar often extols the virtues of Gandhi because he wants to be clear he's not endorsing violent terrorism. He's not doing that, uh, you know, getting behind the Khmer Rouge sort of thing. He's, he's talking about, you know, uh, people who break the law, not necessarily people who do, uh, you know, very violent acts. Uh, so even Balabar, who's trying to endorse this figure, has to do it in his qualified way through Gandhi. So what's interesting to me about this is I, I had this guy, psychoanalyst on Don Carveth, who's, um, focused a lot on sort of like an innate uh, place, biologically innate um, reason to think that we have agency. And he develops in, in this um, uh, notion of the difference between the conscience and the superego. And uh, anyway, wh what I'm getting at is where does that kind of biological logic go for post-structuralists or Marxists who have come out of this sort of uh, Althusserian tradition or existentialists a lot of the time won't look for a biological explanation for agency. They'll, they'll resort to, you know, interesting metaphysical uh, reasonings. Um, why do you think we don't see that in this literature? 
Uh, Althusser makes the argument that we're always already subjects in the sense that we always already want to believe that we have this agency. And that comes from our being embodied beings that are separated from each other in space. So because we're separated from each other, we don't want to view ourselves as all part of the same universe or all part of the same thing because we don't have a sense. We don't have the experience of being all part of the same thing. So because we always already want to believe that we're individuated, it's very easy for the state to invite us to believe this because the state is leaning into the uh, appearance that comes from embodiment itself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> different from something like, you know, Plato, who thinks that you have to go to great lengths to make sure that people uh, don't just think about themselves as, as individuals. You know, so who, who thinks well, that you've got to we'll definitely organize your soul to avoid that problem. Yeah. Uh, we'll be getting into Plato more for sure, too, um, for obvious reasons to you. Um but uh, yeah, I mean, I hate to like get into the the nitty gritty philosophical stuff on this for, you know, the sake of the audience. But you do actually I mean, you end this chapter getting into what Adorno you get into and um, Balabar you already mentioned. And this topic really does become it goes right to the heart of philosophy in so many different ways. And um. That actually brings us into the into the next essay is just how complicated this gets, what type of people are capable of talking about it and understanding it. And, uh, you know, what are the requirements for becoming revolutionary and having the consciousness of a, a revolutionary subject? Your next essay is called The American University System is a Rotting Carcass or... Uh, if uh, if you watch um, that TV show about vampires, you would pronounce it carcass. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so in this essay, it's funny because last time we talked, uh, I kind of blew off talking about education. And um, I also uh, kind of blew off talking about equality. And you brought both of those things together into this one essay. And uh, we definitely have to talk about it now. And we're going to talk about it now. So um, tell us about this rotting carcass, the, uh, the American university system. Yeah. So, you know, I think that a lot of the time, because people who do this kind of theory work in universities, there is a reluctance to talk about how weird and deformed they are, uh, at least you know, not outside the bounds of uh, trade unionism related to the university system. People will talk about the marketization of the university when they're in the picket line, but uh, to really you know, criticize the whole thing, you have to, I think, uh, talk about what's lost in trying to extend university education to everybody, what it is that the university can't do anymore when it's uh, for everybody. And so in this piece, I, I make the argument that, you know, there's an attempt always to legitimate the university system because the people who are in it need the rest of society. And for most of human history, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of people in, in the universities or in the monasteries back in the Middle Ages, which used to perform similar functions, right? Tiny, tiny percentage. And all of these other people who, who might go, well, why am I feeding this, you know, nerdy scholar who can't even see, right? You know, can't do any practical activity, why should I fund this person? Uh, what, what good are they, right? So the classical argument that you make is, you know, you have to get all of the nobles and elites to go to the universities so that they, uh, you know, become civilized, right? And they become cool. And, uh, you know, you, you, in Rome, you have to learn Greek and you've got to be able to write well in Latin because if you can't do these things, you don't seem like an appropriate elite. Right. If you want to have a good career, you have to do these things. It's, it's part of seeming like you know, somebody who's got cultural cachet. Right. Uh, but once your education system is not just for these elites who are engaged in a status competition with each other, but it's for ordinary people. Ordinary people go to university either because they want to use what they learn at university to help their friends and family and neighbors to do something politically 
or they go to university because they themselves want to get a, a, a career, right? So these people are going, why should I learn Plato or Aristotle? You know, why should I read uh, Latin and Greek? Uh, what's this going to do for me? And they have a point. If you're in the university system to engage in practical activity uh, and you're trying to make money or you're trying to achieve a level of financial stability for you and for your family, it's not very useful to learn these elite skills. So these elite skills tend to fade away as the universities struggle to justify continuing to teach them. You know, and there's this, you see these hilarious arguments where they claim, oh, you know, learning Latin is really good for your test scores, you know, to try to convince the high schools to continue to teach it. It's, these are ridiculous arguments that have nothing to do with why Latin was originally in the schools, right? And the reasons that uh, Latin was originally in the schools is that that's how you make an elite out of someone. That's how you make someone who can talk and sound and act and behave in a way that makes them cool within a very elite class. That class no longer exists in the same way. At this point, most of the really rich people in the world are not part of old elite noble families. They're people who at some point in the industrial revolution or later, one of their ancestors ran a very successful business. And people who run very successful businesses, when they send their kids to school, they don't go, oh, I want my kid to learn Latin and Greek. They go, I want my kid to learn what they need to learn to also go into business and be successful in the same kind of way I was. Oftentimes people in those situations deliberately deprive their kids of opportunities and money to try to force their kids to learn something from hardship the way that they did when they were getting going. It's interesting how being a class migrant affects the way that people think about this stuff. A lot of people who think of themselves as having made their own money don't want their kids to have an aristocratic kind of upbringing or education, don't want their kids to be too comfortable uh, and to spend their time thinking about things that, you know, art and, and other things that aren't practical, right? So if you have elites that are thinking in terms of instrumental value and you have ordinary workers who are thinking in terms of, I need to get a job. And over time, it's getting harder and harder and harder for people to get good jobs that pay good money. You're gonna have more and more workers flooding into the remaining disciplines that seem like they're good financial bets. So you have this hyper expansion of STEM and a contraction of everything else, right? And the effect of all of this is that the university system uh, no longer equips people to be elites. And the real elites are not the people who go to school just to get honor and status from learning Greek and Latin. The real elites are the people who go there and realize why they're reading Plato. They're reading Plato because Plato is there to help them think about how to construct society, how to run the state, how to generate new norms, new, uh, print, new uh, structures, right? What they're really there to do is not to just replicate the habits of previous elites. They're there to learn about how to subtly and intelligently change the state, change the structures, change the norms, change the rituals in society to shape how the next generation of people comes about. It doesn't take very many people to, to grasp this. Most people who read Plato and Aristotle won't pick up on this kind of stuff. You know, they won't think about it in that kind of way. Uh, they'll just learn it and, and be able to quote it and they'll seem cool because they can quote it, right? Uh, right? But as long as a small number of people figure this out, the system keeps going. And the thing is, you can have enormous numbers of people going to these universities and never figuring out what that kind of education is really for. It can be something that only really goes on at the Ivy League schools and you know, Oxbridge and not very many other places because you don't need that many elites to run this system. You don't need everybody to have access to this. And indeed, it was always a lie that everybody had access to it. And it's becoming more and more self-evidently a lie as more and more of these universities give up on even pretending to teach these subjects. So one of the things that um, you get at is like this sort of assumption about what people are capable of in Plato or I forget the, the gentleman's name who uh, did the theurgic. Uh, Yamblichus. Yeah, which new to me, very interesting, but um, they make this assumption about what normal people are capable of. And they basically say they're only capable of being caring about honor or caring about, you know, immediate pleasure and things like that. And so, you know, we have to subordinate them to a discipline of their, their passions and this, that, and the other. And 
um, this ties a lot into, you know, again, something you were talking about in your other book, which is the snobbery of uh, academics or people who, you know, the rump uh, graduates, I forget the, the way that you put it, the rump, um, yeah, the rump professionals. professionals. Yeah, yeah. And the fallen professionals. And um, uh, what, how would you, uh, well, well, how would you characterize the assumptions about non-graduates that university, the university system makes now? Would you say it's like a, they're doing it for honor, they're just hedonists? What, what is the, the stereotype these days? Well, I think the stereotype these days is that they're, you know, believing in conspiracy theories and they're bigots and they're in the basket of deplorables. You know, that because they, you know, and then you've also got a kind of alternative right-wing version of this where they're all low IQ and they have, uh, you know, bad genetics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, if you find that online, that's, that's still going around these days, these kind of biological natural slave arguments on Twitter, uh, among the, the far right crowd. Uh, but you know, the, uh, the original argument, I think, just comes from the fact that in an agricultural society, it's not going to be possible to have all of these people emancipated from work and participating in the elite. So since you're not going to have this, it's easy to naturalize it and to go, well, the reason that not everybody can be in the leisure class is that not everyone's capable of being in the leisure class. Uh, you know, that's a, an easier move to make in an agricultural society. And I think it's not as uh, morally repulsive in that context because uh, in that context, that would seem to be the natural order to somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. These days, it's a weirder argument to make. Under capitalism, it seems clear that it is possible to alleviate uh, the burden of work uh, for more people. And yet some people insist that if you did this, those people would never be able to accomplish anything and they would waste the time and it would be no good. And, and these people are now having to insist upon this in conditions where it's easier to see how it might be possible for fewer people to work, and yet they continue to insist upon it. So I think it's a, a, a worse argument now because of the context now than it was then, right? Uh, back then, these guys are really talking about how do you maintain an agricultural society? What, what's required to maintain it? Well, you do need most of the population to be involved in production. And therefore, you have to come up with some sort of story about why uh, that's OK. And you have to keep these producers happy being producers, because uh, since they're involved in production, they're not going to be getting the kind of education or spending their time doing the kinds of, of activities that the rulers are going to be doing. And therefore, it becomes very important if you're a ruler who thinks that doing this training for ruling is important for ruling well, which, of course, if you're a ruler, that's what you would think. It's important to stop these people who don't get the training from taking over the thing. So I think a really good example uh, of this kind of um, newfangled way of dismissing people has played out recently. I don't know if you uh, how online you are or not, but... Recently, there is a debate with Destiny, the YouTuber, and Norm Finkelstein, and uh, uh, Benny Morris, and uh, I forget the other guy's name. Yeah, but I saw one clips of the, from that. I haven't watched the whole thing. Well, one of the big outcomes is that people are going on and on about, hey, you got these three really well-educated guys, and then you got a YouTube streamer who reads Wikipedia. And... There, that's, I mean, that's just a very strong example of a common theme in attitudes towards uh, the un, undegreed, um, uncredentialed that we have in this society. And we still have, you know, all of this kind of uh, elitism that's born out of getting a university education and uh, it's still applied um all the time in subtle and not so subtle ways. And so what, so if we know the university, this is one of the consequences of it, not just on the, uh, the training itself and whether or not, you know, objectively you're really giving people the keys to the kingdom, but as far as subjectively the attitudes that you're generating uh, if we know that this is one of the consequences and that it doesn't actually tend to lead towards 
uh, revolutionary situation. It tends to lead towards, you know, keeping people in their place. Where else do you think we could look for this kind of revolutionary subjectivity uh, if it's not the university? Yeah, I think this is a, a really interesting question. And it's something I've been thinking about recently. And I, I'm not going to pretend that I have it all worked out. Uh, but I do think that we probably are going to need some new institutions uh, because the university is increasingly not performing this kind of role. Uh, I think sometimes about the role that the monasteries played in the late Roman Empire of allowing a tradition that was uh, being suppressed by the authorities to perpetuate itself and eventually to disseminate itself, you know, to overcome a period where it was suppressed and it was very marginal and to nonetheless later on spread and become uh, dominant. Uh, other kind, there seem to be other kinds of educational institutions that can be used. I think we sometimes naturalize this idea that the university has always been what it is and, and that it's the only kind of institution that can perform this role. But the university system, you know, originally, it was not that different from the monastery system. It was the main thing that was different is that in the university, it's uh, you know you give one talk to everybody, right? A lecture, right? And anyone can give the lecture because it's the same lecture regardless of who gives it. And uh, the people who hear it hear the same lecture regardless of of who they are. And in the monastery, the the idea is that you've got to know the soul of the student so that you can make an uh, intervention that's appropriate. So you have a personal relationship if you're the pedagogue which, with each of the students and you come to know the, the soul of the student and then you give the student what the student needs to ascend the ladder of virtues and get to the next level. The monastic system was more platonic in its influence and the university system was more Aristotelian, which as you might expect results in uh, you know, scholasticism becoming the dominant strand in the university system uh, and scholasticism you know, playing a very large role in, in uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas and then in the church's uh, uh, position and then in, in the position of all of the Westerners as the Westerners reacted to that church position that had been in, instituted. But if you look at the period before the university system really came into vogue in the, you know, the 13th century, uh, you know, prior to that, you had a very different educational system that uh, was able to produce elites that were able to function uh, within that kind of society, within the kind of society in which they live. Uh, and uh, I think nowadays we tend to kind of make fun of it as, as superstition or, or what have you, but uh, it was philosophical education. You know, they were reading texts that you would assign today in all likelihood uh, to someone who was studying classics or studying uh, you know, theology. And a lot of the texts they were assigning were not you know, obviously bad or stupid texts, you know, uh, platonic uh, dialogues, Augustine, you know, interesting stuff. So I, I wonder if maybe we could come up with institutions that perform that kind of function for socialism, uh, you know, for Marxism or for anarchism. Could there be uh, ways of, of doing learning? Because right now, it, most of what people are doing is a kind of patron model where- yeah. You have a set of patrons and they give you money. And the difficulty with patrons is that, you know, no disrespect to anybody, because I like patrons. I mean, we all do. Uh, yeah. But there's a tendency to get siloed when you have patrons, because patrons are weird people. They're people who are willing to give money to weird, like, left-wing stuff. So they tend to have niche interests or interests that are unusual. And that often takes the content further and further away from ordinary uh, you know, uh, ordinary discussion, discussions that could be interesting or influential among ordinary working people. And yeah, polit it politicizes it, right? Yeah, yeah. Things that aren't necessarily, not ne unnecessarily uh, politicized. Yeah. Um, I actually was, uh, we got on this topic, the last person I interviewed, well, the whole interview was kind of on this topic, but the topic of pedagogy, but then also how to, what these alternatives could be, but yeah, we, what we see is it's not just like a patronage model. It's really like a, um, you know, some might say grifter, but there is like <clears throat> the, the monetary motivation is really large and 
it's individuated. You know, you what I see is like I'll see maybe uh I think there's this um guy named Thaddeus Russell a little while ago did something called unregistered university and he would have, you know, people, I think Ben Burgess actually did a class there on Marxism, but he would have other people do courses. And uh, I don't know how successful it really was, but to me, the clear challenge is, um, you know, it is that your, who are you paying? How is it getting funded? And like, what goal, what's the objective goal of the institution, right? And so like, at least like in the past when you had the modern school or you had like unions, like the CMT in Spain or whatever would create education programs for students. And they would, I don't know, maybe have some dogma or some, you know, studies of socialism, but really they're teaching science, they're teaching history, they're teaching the topics that we would have just described as normal or not necessarily needing to be politicized. And I just, I just come back over and over again to the fact that, you know, unions, <laughs> unions are still to me the way that to achieve this goal. What do you think about that? Yeah. So of course I, I like unions and I think that we should have them insofar as we still can. I think that part of what makes it much harder now than it was in the 19th century is that the situation is less obvious than it used to be. You know, it used to be that the workers were just dying in the street of, of diphtheria and tuberculosis and all kinds of stuff all the time. You know, if you wanted to see what the effect was of working in a unregulated coal mine, it was pretty easy to, to find out. You know, Emil Zola wrote that book, but you don't have to you know, write a book like that for it to be pretty clear and obvious to people uh, that, being a worker in industrial society is not fun and doesn't tend to end well. These days, it's much more confusing. Uh, we have a much more confusing culture with much more sources of mediation that obscure the domination that occurs and make it easier for people to rationalize it or tell themselves that it's, uh, it's okay. And I think that that makes it harder for us to rely on the kinds of institutions that we would have relied on in the 19th century. Uh, there clearly is still space for those institutions to exist uh, and to perform some kind of role, but I'm skeptical that they can perform the role that was envisioned for them by anarchist and Marxist theory originally. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't want to push too much on this because who the hell has an answer to it, right? We'd be out there doing it if we did. But um uh, I was, I'm actually a little surprised that, you know, when I asked you where we could see revolutionary subjectivity developing, you didn't immediately just go into the last essay in the book, which is your uh, requiem for, uh, for a soldier. Yeah. Which, um, you know, you kind of, you kind of provide that as a, a possible answer. So. Yes, I do give there, a different, I, I take a different tack in that piece. So uh, staying still on the university piece, there's this question about an education that outfits you to have values that are very much at odds with, with the society, right? That's the, the focus of that piece. The university clearly doesn't do that. Uh, but maybe there's another institution that could preserve or perhaps even disseminate values that are otherwise being suppressed. That's what makes me think about the Christian monasteries, because they were functional in a time when the thing that they were there to preserve and disseminate was being repressed straightforwardly, right? In the last piece, I focus, yeah, on the soldier, because if you actually have a, a you know, general strike, if you were to get to that stage, you still can only win if when they call out the troops to clear the square and tell the troops to shoot you or bulldoze your camp, the troops don't do it. And I think people often talk past this. They think, well, if you could get people out in the streets, of course the soldiers would not shoot them. I mean, how could they? Well, actually, most of the time, historically, they do. Most of the time when they're told to clear the square, that is what they do. Most of the time, they don't even need to call out the troops. They ask the cops to do it. You have to have something that's big enough that the cops can't do it, right? And the cops tend to be more ideological than the soldiers as a rule, right? Uh, 
The soldiers, if you have soldiers that are drawn from every part of the population, then yeah, you'll have soldiers that look like the rest of the population and there might be sympathy. But one of the things we've done is we've gotten rid of the conscription, we've gotten rid of the draft. It's become really difficult to uh, get people to sign up for the army if they're the kinds of people who would ordinarily participate in left-wing stuff. People who go to university do not join the army, generally speaking. Some people join the army as a means to go to university later, but you don't have a lot of people going to university for the purposes of joining the army. Uh, that doesn't tend to happen. So most of the people who are going out and doing demonstrations are university people and not army people. And that means that uh, if the army is told to deal with them, which currently we never even get to the point where the army has to be told to deal with them because they never do demonstrations that are actually a threat in such a way that the army is called out. But even supposing we were to get there, I don't think the troops would really uh, bat an eye at dealing with them. Uh, you know, they didn't bat an eye during the, you know, uh, 1932 when they were asked to clear out the bonus army. When mm -hmm. the bonus army marched on D.C. to demand early payment of the bonuses, those were World War, Vet World War I veterans. And the active duty troops ran them over with tanks in 1932. Douglas MacArthur thought they were a bunch of communists. So he decided that they needed to bulldoze the camp with tanks to send a message and he didn't even ask Hoover for permission. Hoover had to pretend he had been okay with it the whole time, even though he hadn't really been kept informed of what was going on. Yeah, and MacArthur ran them over with tanks and the guys driving the tanks just did it. They just did what they were told because if you say no, you're going to prison, you're, you're mutineer, you're guilty of treason, you could be executed, there could be a civil war. Who knows what happens if you say no? So the troops have to be pretty sympathetic. And they have to be pretty sure that the, the other troops are also going to be sympathetic, that the other troops are also going to feel the way they feel. Because if you're the only one in your unit who doesn't want to shoot, you know, you can fire into the sky uh, instead of firing at the crowd and the rest of your unit will fire into the crowd. And it won't make any difference that you fired into the sky. You need to be confident enough that the guys next to you will also join you in refusing to shoot. Uh, and that none of them will respond to, to you by, by pointing their guns at you. Uh, so you really need a sense of solidarity that's quite strong. And I think this is the really underestimated thing these days. Uh, the new left and the kind of post-Marxist left doesn't care about solidarity with the soldiers or the veterans. It doesn't prioritize it, uh, doesn't think about it. And so of course, none of the stuff that they do makes any difference. There's, there's a lot to go with this. Um, but in the uh, so it might be a little hard for me to keep this coherent, but, um, you know, obviously in the structure of the book, you begin with something related to the military. You end with something related to the military and uh, you do bring out, you know, that this is, um, you know, sort of like a sidelined issue of the just knowledge about the military, considering them, considering soldiers, understanding, you know, the role and function and consequences of, you know, different types of civilian military relations on a revolutionary process. This is all stuff that has really pissed me off for a long time because um, I, you know, I come from a uh, hippie generation parents and who are all worried about the draft. And it was always clear to me that one of the points of leverage that that generation had on the war in Vietnam was the fact that they were conscripted uh, civilians. Right. And when we moved into this um, voluntary military system, there's this selection bias, which is what you're talking about where you know the amount of patriotism and the amount of loyalty that you're that you're basically now getting like a hundred percent of there's other push and pull factors but you really have a high level of loyalty in the military now which you know uh definitely leads to this situation where the people who are coming out during you know to put down the revolt are not going to think twice about it. They're already self-selecting into really a different world. And 
Um, failure to look at that world, I think, has condemned the left to, uh, you know, a civilian politics that is almost incapable. I don't want to say like doesn't understand international relations and doesn't understand things uh, in a in the way that they really work, but tends to co- to explain power politics in like a civilian way, where they use these analogies of the way that we deal with civil society for events taking place between states, and this. That, sorry, it just drives me crazy, but oh yeah, yeah, me too, me too. You know, they 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 don't get how states work at all. They are so uh, discomforted by the way that states operate and work that they don't want to think about it. And it means the only leverage they've got is electoral. It forces you into an electoralist position because that's the only thing you can do. The only thing you can do that Joe Biden will care about if you. Uh, opposed Joe Biden's position on, say, Ukraine or on Gaza, is not vote for him and right. vote instead for Trump. And of course, in 2020, a lot of people on the left said you can't vote for Trump because he's a fascist and, and a Nazi and a very, very bad man, right? So all of these people said this in 2020, and now Joe Biden is supposed to believe that they will tell their followers and their fans to not vote for him in 2024. That you know, we'll get to October, and these people will still be saying, "Don't vote for him." When his opponent is Trump, right. Joe Biden will call their bluff on that, which is what he's doing. Yeah, and then another thing—it's outside of the the scope of what we've been talking about. But there's the materialist part of this too, where you know, a huge chunk of innovation, and you know, uh, I mean. A lot of what we get in consumer in our consumers culture is a result of military funded R and D, and um, I think the lack of writing on like things like military economics and how military expenditures work and that whole process and how it filters in the civil society, you know, leaves us in that we're like we debate with these like libertarian party people that. This, the difference between markets and the state, we all know that this is like an illusion. We on the left, I mean. <laughs> um, but yet we're not, you know, we're not following up and being like, okay, if we realize that all this R&D and, you know, a lot of our inventions and new technologies and medicines and things are being financed through the military, then... Why aren't we like moving on and really getting into the numbers, looking at the data, figuring out like, you know, the economy of the military and how it interacts with civil society and things like this. And instead of just seeing it as like war machine, period. And yeah. And if you don't have people in the military and in the defense industry, how are you supposed to know what's actually being done with that money? Because a lot of it is behind uh, security walls. A lot of it requires levels of clearance. And it astounds me how many civilians on the left think they know what the state is doing or think they know or think they can grasp. Uh, You know, sometimes they engage in conspiracy theory and other times they just, you know, think they know uh, what kind of AI research the state possesses or what, uh, you know, kinds of weapons the state has. And they think they can have conversations about how a war would go, say, between the United States and, and uh, China. Uh, it's ridiculous for someone who doesn't have access to that information to presume to know what the course of that conflict would be. And this is something that gets exposed all the time. So often people who are otherwise smart people, and you know, you know I've, I've done this myself before, have assumed that wars would go certain ways based on publicly available knowledge. We just do not know. We don't right. know. And there are very few of us who are even get into position to know. And then it also, you know, there's a perversion that happens on the right where, you know, like Snowden, the Snowden leaks has been kind of taken up as a right wing problem somehow. When, you know, initially when the leaks came out uh, about the NSA's monitoring and everything, you know, the left 
talked a lot about it, but then as, as, uh, as, sorry, not just Snowden, but also Julian Assange, as these people have, you know, as time has gone on, somehow it's become more of a right wing issue. I don't know why, but there is a, there is a different thing that happens on the right where, (laughs) where they all, they think they know everything in a military way, in a different way. And it's like, the, and then the everything leftist, gets complicated by private public partnerships and, and the left has taken like the that. side of the intelligence services because the intelligence services are opposed to Trump. Trump is you know, on the record having you know, declared the former director of the FBI to be his enemy. The you know, former director of the CIA has said that they regarded Trump as, as a hostile actor. Uh, you know, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said they're not going to F and succeed because we've got the guns and they don't you know, in reference to Trump and his group. Uh, So, you know, for this reason, a lot of people on the left have just decided that they like the intelligence services now because the intelligence services seem to them to be against fascism, uh, which I think shows Um, how totally out of touch these people are. Well, actually, just to add on to that whole against fascism thing, there's some, you know, pretty popular cases right now of people joining intelligence community organizations. I won't name the name or actually there's a few of them. Uh, and sort of getting a pass because it's seen as anti-fascist work. And, um, and because I think, you know, the, this, uh, shift on the left towards embracing the intelligence community is, I think, softened up, you know, otherwise very anti-militarist, uh, stances on things, but yeah, the anti, anti-fascist researchers joining, um, uh, intelligence community organizations to continue and further their their uh, their fight against the uh, the fascist takeover is a real thing. That <laughs> yeah, you can join the intelligence services, but you better not work for Raytheon or Northrop or Lockheed. Oh right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you can't yeah, do that. It's either, ridiculous. Yeah. it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Um, so how can we tie this back into the topic of subjectivity? I think maybe, you know, we've explored the official university education. The military also has its systems of education and it's, uh, you know, in this way has a different constitutive role than something that, you know, would come from uh, the fingers, you know, the state apparatuses or whatever that Althusser who's there is talking about. Um, yeah. Something I would you, raise in reference to that uh, briefly, you know, I think the military education, you know, you go to the boot camp and they drill you and all that. It seems to produce a much more ideologically diverse army than the universities produce. At this point, it seems to me that there's greater ideological diversity within the army than there is within the cohort of people who come out of the universities within the professional class. Uh, and this is something I would love to see empirically studied. I'd love to see it compared, ideological diversity within the armed forces versus ideological diversity among university graduates, uh, which which is greater at this point. I think yeah, it's that'd a be, fun question. It'd be really interesting because uh, there's different incentives. And, you know, in a sense, you know, policy comes out of universities sometimes. But in another sense, like soldiers die so the uh, the incentive to get this stuff right is a little less ideologically motivated, I would think. I don't know. But, yeah, I'd like to see that. Study. There's a lot sure. of repression behind the, the soldiers at all points. You know, the soldier education involves constant threat of repression. If you don't do what you're contractually obligated to do, you, know, you can get in big trouble with the state and you can get court martialed and you can get you know, really very quickly, because when you enlist, you sign away a lot of your rights to to do things that people would ordinarily do. So the way that you are socialized in the army is more straight up because it involves a lot of of brute coercion. It's it's the state. So somebody can follow the rules in the army and keep in their head all kinds of thoughts about how maybe they don't agree with what's going on. Uh, But in the university system, it's a model of socialization that's based more around social control and involves trying to get you to feel guilty or feel shame or to identify with the things that you're being pushed to indoors. So I think it it seems to me that the way that the army socializes would leave you more room to have a wider variety of views. 
but I would love to see that properly researched rather than just uh, you know me making making guesses. Right, and of course, it'd be very hard to research it uh, to get all the permissions that you would need to collect that kind of data and so on and so forth. But yeah, you might be able to talk to veterans after they've left mm -hmm. left the military, but by that point, you know, veterans have also seen a lot of stuff. That, yeah. Uh, comes in on top of all that. So an ongoing, just to shift it up a little, an ongoing theme, I think, in your book. Now, just to clarify, this was the last essay in the book. So now we're just getting into, you know, open discussion more. Um, an ongoing theme seems to be the deception uh, or how deceptive the voluntary nature of the state can be whether we're talking about, you know, with denationalization, you know, it's a little deceptive that including everybody in the state is um, more liberatory. Or with education, it seems like including everybody in the system of edu education is going to be more liberatory. Um, not sure exactly how to pull it out of the first two essays, but just because we've been talking about the last two. Oh wait, that was the, whatever. Anyway, um, where do you think we could, uh, I don't know what I want to ask about this. So is inclusivity always a good thing, always a bad thing? Do we need to be very critical of it? And uh, is there... I don't know. I don't know what I'm asking. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think maybe I can get at what your your point might be. So I think that, and I, I'm working on a book that will be coming out later this year with Edinburgh University Press that gets into this point a little bit that I'm about to make. But uh, I think that a lot of the time states cover for major inequalities in outcomes by making things marginally more equal in terms of input, at least apparently. So mm -hmm. you include, you give people the vote, you include people in the deliberative spaces, you give people an opportunity to participate, you do things to try to make them feel more participatory in the space through things like descriptive representation, ensuring the representatives look like, sound like, come from a similar background uh, culturally. You do things to create this sense of participation but this doesn't actually get you the results. And you work off the fact that people assume that if you democratize something or if you localize something, that that will result in the local area being served better or the parts of the population that have previously been less participatory being served better. It's not obviously the case that this happens. Indeed, there are lots and lots of ways you can use increasing participation or inclusion, uh, not just to paper over the fact that things are becoming increasingly less equal, uh, but also I think you can use them to create points of, of veto and lock up in institutions so that you always have the excuse that, well, you tried to do it, but you couldn't all agree on what to do. And you see this often happening in left-wing spaces. And you know, this is where people start to go, is there a plant from the CIA or the FBI in this room with us, right? Because someone will disrupt the meeting by raising objections on petty, silly things that you know, don't seem important, but because the rules are, you gotta you know, hear everybody out and we all have to come to an agreement and we need to you know, operate with consensus and not coerce people. You know, if you think in this way, uh, and you think in this way uh, too rigidly, you'll get into a situation where the group can't take decisions and spends all of its time talking. And then people will quit because it's not accomplishing anything for them. Uh, and that's part of why these groups are afraid to ask people to contribute money and dues because they spend all their time talking and nobody does anything. And so nothing ever gets accomplished. Uh, mm. So yeah, I think that comes from, and it's a little bit of a, a, an overreaction to the statism of the mid-century left. You know, the post-war era, Althusser, very, very state-oriented left, where what you're supposed to do is capture the state, you know, establish the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? There's a, a sense among a lot of people that that 
maybe it doesn't inevitably lead to Stalinism, but that there's a non-zero chance that it will. And at any rate, it's very embarrassing to be associated with all of it. So instead, you, you commit to horizontalism and inclusion and procedural fairness. And these become fetishes to the point where you forget what you're actually supposed to do as an organization. And you don't pay attention to the fact that this stuff has started to actually get in the way actively, not just to distract from the fact that you're not achieving anything, but to actively get in the way. Would you say that this is a, a too much of an emphasis on form over content uh, or formal structure over, over the substance of, uh, I would guess, the goals and values of an organization and things like that? Yeah, I think it also stems from, and, and this comes from the universities, this thinking that if you just change the way stuff is structured, the form, the procedural form of stuff, that that will give rise to better kinds of decisions. That what you really just need is a deliberative space, you know, organized in the right way, you know, bureaucratically managed in the right way, and that that will result in the right kind of discussion. Uh, and of course, the only people who can design the spaces are people who are professionals who have you know, specialized in space design, you know, who know what it, it takes to make a safe space or make an inclusive space or make a space where people feel participatory. So it elevates a portion of the movement above the rest of it. Uh, even as it claims that it's making everybody equal, the people who know what procedural inclusion means and can decide what it means or know what it means to inform the deliberative space, those people are the ones who actually have leadership roles. And uh, to come back to Plato, actually, in my first book, Chronic Crisis of American Democracy, The Way It Shut, I talk a little bit about this in reference to Plato and Athens. One of Plato's critiques of Athenian democracy is that it's not actually the ordinary people of Athens who are doing most of the politics. It's this small group of orators and rhetoricians, people who are really good at talking because they've been to rhetoric school and they know how to debate and they know how to talk in a way that makes it sound like they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And these are the people who actually make all the decisions and everybody else just comes along and you know supports one or, or the other of them. And these people you know, don't actually give the ordinary citizens of Athens very much of the benefits of what they are able to take from the rich. They keep most of it for themselves and play this kind of mediating role. And it's frustration with this group of talkers that for Plato eventually causes the democracy to die because eventually this frustration causes the ordinary people to get behind some kind of protector or savior figure who will crush all of these orders who have been deceiving and tricking them and install a regime that actually delivers on the promise that has never been delivered upon. Uh, this is how you eventually wear out people's interest in democracy by continually promising them that their inclusion will give them something and it never actually gives them anything. Um, so let's start tying this up a little. What makes you so willing to be a Debbie Downer on the left? And um, you know, who like, you know, you, you, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, that a lot of people are unwilling to examine these things because they know that their peer groups are going to think they're not cool or, you know, you're not going to have that sort of uh, dopamine hit you get on Twitter when someone likes your shit. What makes you uh, willing to play that role of the, uh, the bubble burster? Well, you know, this is asking me to psychologically evaluate myself. Which, <laughs> That's know, true. Always, I'm willing to try, but I, just throwing out a warning here, I, of course, will not notice everything about myself, and, and you should take my own self-analysis with a grain of salt. It also can be loaded in all kinds of ways by, you know, my, my position. But I would say that a couple of things that are clearly factors for me is, one, uh, my father was an engineer who worked on magnets and then uh, control systems. My brother is also a, an engineer. And when you come from a family where lots of people are engineers, there's this question of, does it work? You know, does it actually work? You know, but but does, it, does it accomplish anything? And that for me comes up all the time in what I do. You know, okay, people are saying all of this and they're saying it, you know, because they think it sounds nice, but does it actually get us anywhere? Uh, the willingness to ask that question and to put it in front of maybe being polite or maybe uh, making everybody happy, I think that's something that comes very much from that, that science-y uh, engineering family. And the other thing 
is that I kind of have a, a little bit of a rule of thumb that I follow in my life, which is to never get too involved with anything in particular and to never depend on any, anybody uh, that I'm friends with mainly for political reasons. If my friendship comes out of politics with somebody, I can't look to them too much for friendship or for support. Because if I do that, then I'm going to feel like I have to keep my politics in step with them. So the people that I lean on have to be people who would come with me if my politics were to change, rather than people that I need uh, for political reasons. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Both both of those uh, both of those explanations. Um, so the last thing I wanted to get to, I asked you to read a an essay by Kropotkin. I think it was called for the an appeal to the youth and uh, you did, you said you did. So I wanted to talk about it a little because you, this uh, collection of essays you put out, it seems to be directed at a similar kind of audience for a similar objective, but you know, context, you know, plays a huge role in why I think your essays turn out so different than his appeal to the youth. And first, I just wanted to hear, like, what did you think of that essay uh, written in 18, I don't know, 80 something? And, you know, would you say that you kind of, uh, you would put yourself in the same, this, this piece uh, that you put out in the same category of, uh, writings is that? Yeah, so I, I thought that was a great example of a 19th century socialist essay. You know, and I, I like the way that he points out, okay, so you're interested in becoming a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, you know, which are still most of the professional jobs that interest uh, people who go through the education system. Uh, but don't you realize that if you do this thing, you're eventually going to end up in a situation where the uh, limits of the system that we're in confront you in a way that forces you either to abandon your principles and values and beliefs uh, or you know, drives you out of the profession. You know, when you're a doctor, you'll eventually notice that uh, you need a completely different society for people to not get sick all the time, right? And we could talk about this now in relation to obesity. I mean, they're trying to abolish this condition with Ozempic, right? But there's this you know, physical you know, sign that there's something sick about the whole society. And no matter what a doctor tells somebody, who's developed a dependence on, on a substance or, or what have you, that's not going to change the situation. The reason that they're indulging in that dependence is that there's something wrong in the background conditions. Uh, similar thing for, for lawyers. Eventually lawyers will realize that justice and the law does not coincide as much as they might like it to. And at that point, either they have to be on the side of justice or the law. Uh, and then a point about engineers, you know, the engineer will, will discover that the stuff that they're building uh, doesn't actually benefit ordinary people in any way. And if anything becomes a, you know, a mechanism by which those people can be killed or can be uh, hurt in a war or what have you, right? Uh, so I, I thought all of that was very interesting and, and is probably a part of why I myself did not go into these different fields. I felt that ultimately, you would end up just working for some corporation and you'd end up doing something that doesn't really contribute to very much of anything. And I couldn't convince myself that all of that kind of stuff would be uh, ultimately satisfying for me. I, I could never convince myself that what I should spend my life doing is the Midwest checklist, you know, where you <laughs> get your hearse and your spurs and your kidlets and, you know, you have all those things and therefore you're a real person who's deserving of respect. And until you get those things, you are not a real adult and you're not deserving of respect. I've never bought into that whole thing. So I, I found a lot to sympathize with it. The thing that stood out to me is very 19th century about it is the very obvious examples that he uses of people dying in the street of preventable diseases, um, of, you, know, la, you know, people who are unemployed in enormously vast numbers because of an economic shock. These are things the system has found a way to, to prevent from happening, at least in the kind of visible way that Kropotkin talks about it. Uh, and so now, if you were to make this kind of argument to engineers or doctors or lawyers, if you were to show them this essay, I think what they'd say is, well, very clearly those things don't happen anymore because we did succeed in making the world a better place. Our, you know, our previous generations of engineers and doctors and scientists and researchers succeeded in ameliorating all of these conditions uh, by doing the very things that Kropotkin said would never succeed in doing those things. So mm -hmm. I think at this point that that essay would not be effective for trying to persuade those people. Uh, and the thing that I have tried to focus on uh, is also this, this other side of it, which is 
Kropotkin seems to think in this that revolution is something that can really come off and that he doesn't seem to feel a need to persuade people that it can. He talks about, yeah, it might be hard, there might be setbacks, but you know, we'll stick with it and eventually it'll work out. Uh, but he doesn't spend as much time talking about you know, why it will work out or trying to persuade people that it will work out because in the 19th century, you didn't have to persuade people they could do a revolution. In principle, everybody in the 19th century knows you can do a revolution. It hadn't been that long. You know, very clearly it can be done. The question is, you know, uh, you know, sometimes you do one and it doesn't work and a bunch of people end up dead and then you have to try again, you know, like 1848. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can have bad, you know, false dawn revolutions or, or revolutions that don't come off, but everybody knows that you can in principle do one. It's possible to do one. You know, the Decemberists, if they hadn't been blown up by those cannons, you know, they, it might've worked out. You know, it, it was close. You know, maybe, you know, next time you get a few more guys in the army who might be able to not follow that order. You're not that far away. And I think now we're just way further away to the point where a lot of us can't really seriously imagine doing these things. The most most of us can imagine is, is protesting. And most of the time when we protest, it's not even illegal protesting or disruptive protesting. It's you got a permit and then you go and you stand in the place where the state has planned for you to be so that you don't cause any trouble uh, and can't be heard by very many people. Uh, and if you are heard, you're gonna be heard by the wrong sort of people, people that uh, will see you and go, ugh, you know, Clearly, I don't want to be part of that. So I think now the, the real question you have to ask is, is there something else we could do that would be better than this? And what would it mean to really believe that? How would we get ourselves to really believe that there's something else we could do that would be better than this? That's worth putting ourselves at risk over. Because when you do a revolution, you have to take this chance that when the order to shoot the, the demonstrators comes, they might follow it. You have to be willing to take that chance because it's not until the order's given and the troops don't shoot you that you can be sure that they're not gonna shoot you. So you have to really believe in what you're doing. And especially these days, you know, everybody's so worried about staying alive. One of the things that uh, you convinced me that we're really very far from revolution is the way everybody responded to COVID. There's mm. so many people, you know, their reaction to COVID, particularly on the left was, I don't wanna die. I wanna stay alive. That's not a revolutionary attitude. No. Um, and yeah, that's, I, you've made that point a few times and, uh, things I've seen and read from you. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting contrast piece in that way for that reason. Uh, so anyway, I would encourage people, where can they find your book and acquire it so they could read it? Yeah. So this, this, uh, the four essays on the revolutionary subject, I wrote it with uh, Sublation Media. So you can find a number of the essays are individually published with Sublation Online, but uh, the last one about the soldier is exclusive to the, uh, the pamphlet. Uh, I, th I think right now the pamphlet has completely sold out. So it may be difficult to get your hands on it right now, uh, but if you email me or something, I'm sure we can work something out. All right. So uh, email Benjamin Studebaker and uh, get on the, the list uh, for when it's published again. And I would also encourage you to read it alongside Kropotkin's essay, uh, Appeal to the Youth, because, yeah, like, like we've just been saying, there's some interesting similarities and I think even more interesting differences that say a lot about the time we're in now and the difficulties of forming a revolutionary subject. Um, what else are you working on? What can we expect from you in the future? Yeah, so I'm working on a book called Legitimacy in Liberal Democracies that is currently due in November. I'm not sure if it will be November. It might be a little earlier, it might be a little later. There's gonna be a hardcover for that that will be expensive, but then there will be a paperback within a year of that and that paperback will be much cheaper, much cheaper than my first book was. So uh, that's the, the way I've squared it on the second book. The, the second book, there will be a cheaper paperback, but you'll have to wait for it. Can I hold on to you just for like another 10 minutes to ask you one last question? Yeah, you can. Okay, so I, uh, I'm not sure who else I would ask this to because 
you're in my head the legitimacy guy, the state legitimacy guy. And, you know, I've been paying a lot of attention to the Israel-Palestine debates because who hasn't? And one thing that seems to, you know, has come up for a long time before the most recent iteration of these debates is what is the legitimacy of Israel based on, right? And, you know, it's it's often framed as does Israel have the right to exist? And then people play this, uh, you know, semantic game of, you know, rights are not something states have and this, that and the other, which no shit. But the question is really about what is the legitimacy of it? And uh, so I just want to ask not about Israel in particular, but in the time period of like 1948, you know, uh, transitioning out of the mandate system, what were kind of like the the primary assumptions of what made a state legitimate? Yeah, so this is something that comes up in my book. You know, in the 20th century, a lot of accounts of legitimacy are based around this idea that uh, if you don't have legitimacy then you'll have an existential crisis for the state where there will be an actual possibility of revolution or revolt. So you've got to have legitimacy, right? And then you've got some people who think about legitimacy in a normative sense of what should make a state work. You know, what, what does the state have to do to deserve to exist morally? And then you've got other people who put the emphasis instead on what does the state have to do to have its subjects continue to affirm it descriptively? right? Those are very different ways of thinking about the question. So before I would say more, I would, I would want to get a little bit of a sense of whether you're, you're thinking about this in more of the normative way or the descriptive way. Well, I think that's kind of the, I guess, so I guess that's kind of the problem, right? Is because you do have different ways of understanding that question where clearly, let, we'll just take Israel as an example. Clearly, this is a extremely popular war, uh, right now for the citizens of Israel who are not going to be uh, thinking that the state is illegitimate because of it. It's clearly a not popular war for uh, people who are getting bombed by Israel. Um, and, you know, uh, it seems like, you know, on the left in the United States, at least we're, you know, expected to adjudicate this question and uh, find sort of like a form of legitimacy that we can measure Israel against that we usually rely on international law to do or think that we're relying on international law to do that without examining what the League of Nations and the UN were actually thinking when they... Um, you know, or other states were thinking when they recognized Israel or in general recognized each other. You know, there's what, 19, I don't know how many states came out of the the former Ottoman and German colonies and whatever um, territories, but it was a pretty substantial number and there was a whole logic at work there. And I guess I'm asking you like, what was that logic at that time period, because I think it it helps to situate what the question is we should be asking about about that instead of like an arbitrary Democratic Republican idea of what a state should be or like something like that. Yeah. So you know, when the Ottoman Empire broke apart, the British and the French operated in the kind of uh, Whiggish, Whig imperialist uh, frame of these populations are not ready for self-government and have to be administered. During the administration, they can be prepared for self-government, right? That's why we have a British and a French mandate. Uh, and so the task of the, of the European state is to prepare them to be independent. The, uh, you know, then there's questions about what should that independence look like? You have different factions within uh, the, the British mandate about what it should look like. Uh, those are you know, different factions within Britain about what to do, different factions within uh, 
Jewish and and uh, Islamic populations, you have people with different views about what kind of, of state should exist there. Uh, it's it's a question that you can't answer in a way that satisfies everybody because to create a particular kind of state that functions in a particular kind of way, other ways of thinking about it that were under consideration have to be shelved, mm -hmm. right? So ultimately the way that they, they adjudicated it is that they put this partition plan to the UN and they convened a group of states to vote on whether they thought it was a good plan. The, there was an argument against the plan for a binational uh, state or for a state that included everybody. Some of the states that had been partitioned, you know, India, uh, for instance, voted against the partition plan because India took the view that partition plans are things the British do to you that are not good ultimately because they create permanent divisions and they create all kinds of harm as people are forced to move. And, and India understood that that's what would happen and voted against the plan on that basis. And, and you mean between India, between India and Pakistan? Right? Yes, yes. The, and yeah, and, and eventually Bangladesh and, and Sri Lanka as well. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, so India voted against it. And a few other states voted against it, but most of the states were Western black states that to, in various ways felt, uh, I, I think, bad about the Holocaust. I think that was a major factor in the way people voted. And so that didn't really have much to do with what works for the local population. That had mm -hmm. a lot to do with the way that those states felt about recent history and what the Jews did or didn't deserve. You know, a way of thinking about uh, this that you know, I think most people on the left would regard as a little bit troubling just in general, just thinking about the Jews or the Arabs uh, in that kind of way. Uh, so the decision I don't think was really made based on what is a good political solution for the people who are there. It was made based on what makes us feel good about what we're doing since we're the ones who are taking the decision. And this is something with legitimacy that I think we do have to bear in mind most of the time, the standards that someone who's external to a state might have, the values, the priorities, are not the same as those of the people who live in the state, who actually live there. So right now, you know, as you point out, the Israeli state has plenty of legitimacy going for its own population descriptively. The population supports the state broadly. There are issues with Netanyahu, but those kinds of issues are, are common in democracies where the population doesn't like the government but is still committed to the state. That's right. normal in a, in a democracy. Uh, the, but of course you have a Palestinian population which is stateless, which has been constituted by living in Gaza and living in the West Bank, but there is no one who accepts responsibility for the way that they're constituted because there's no one who uh, is, is a state in these, in these territories. And the organizations that are nominally in charge of these territories don't regard themselves as being states and aren't regarded by Israel or by most other states as possessing statehood. So there is no one who is bearing responsibility for how people who are growing up in the Gaza Strip are constituted. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a big uh, state responsibility question. You know, they don't have citizenship, so they haven't made a transaction with a state so they don't have any duties because they haven't received any rights on that conception, right? At the same time, if you take it in a con constitutive sense, the state that clearly has the most control over the way that those people are brought up is Israel. Israel is the only state that has any power over what goes on in the Gaza Strip or the West Bank really to speak of, apart from the United States insofar as the United States can influence Israeli behavior, which you know, how much can the United States influence Israeli behavior? Hard to say, they've got nuclear weapons. Right. So. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, a lot of it, when, when you start to think in terms of uh, descriptive legitimacy and what the local population is feeling, there's a question of you know, who, who, who's the Israeli state ultimately responsible to? Uh, and as right. far as the Israeli state's concerned, it's only the citizens who live in Israeli territory. It's not the people that, it, that the Israeli state, I think, plausibly constitutes, but which it has no transactional arrangement with and which it doesn't accept responsibility for. So how so how much of a shit do you, the people who really recognize states, meaning other states uh, and international bodies, how much do they care about democracy as, uh, 
when it comes to whether or not to actually recognize a state as a state? Is it, I mean, I know like, you know, people will say Israel is or is not a real democracy, uh, you know, therefore has a right to exist or doesn't. But are the, I mean, that can't be the metric uh, internationally because there's a lot of states that aren't democracies that are recognized as states. So, you know, and then uh, on the other hand, it's like, so, so if you can't, you know, determine whether or not to recognize it as a state based on its democratic credentials, then what are you, what is the metric, right? And I think that's, that's sort of the big question. Uh, and I think one that, you know, your work helps a lot of people to think about in a downstream way, because when we, you know, even talking about the national, um, you know, nationalization and denationalization question, we are kind of getting at this sort of uh, contradictory way that citizenship, statehood, and legitimacy work together. Yeah, part of the trouble with all of this is that states are facts. You know, there's states control territory on the planet Earth, and they control it in certain fundamental senses. And you can recognize or not recognize the entity that controls territory on a certain portion of the earth. Uh, ultimately, that entity controls territory on a certain portion of the earth. So it becomes a little silly sometimes when states try to withhold recognition or play games about recognition, because ultimately, if you want to interact with that part of the earth's surface in any way, shape or form, you're going to have to deal with the people who control it. And what ultimately I think drives state behavior here is whether or not they really feel a need to interact with the people who control that portion of the territory of the surface of the earth. Small states that are very far away from other small states might go, I don't need to recognize this state that's on the other side of the world, especially because the United States will you know, give me something if I don't do this. Uh, and it's a you know, diplomatic game, and yet they'll give me a material reward for saying something about a part of the world I don't have anything to do with. Uh, you know, and I think that is often the thing that's really going on in international politics when we start talking about recognition. It's not like these states are really taking principled stances. Uh, either you have to interact with the territory, so you've got to recognize it so that you can interact with it, right? Or uh, maybe if you're providing security for Taiwan, like the United States is, you can not recognize it, but provide security for it. And they'll talk to you, even though you, they don't have technical formal recognition because you're doing something for them in lieu of giving them formal recognition. Now, sometimes you can have an arrangement like that. But you know, these are very different kinds of arrangements from the sort of moralizing discourse that I think the left often assumes is, is the thing that drives or ought to drive this behavior. I don't think there are too many people on the left who really think it does drive this behavior, but there are certainly a lot of people who think it ought to drive the behavior. I would just make the point that ultimately, if you want to have peace in a world with multiple different political entities, uh, sometimes you're going to have to recognize entities that you don't normal, normatively like or that you wish did not exist right? Like you in your own life, if you don't like the state that you live in, you could refuse to recognize the state that sure. you live in. Right. You know, and maybe normatively in some way, shape or form, that is the position you ought to have, but pragmatically, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good. Become a sovereign citizen. <laughs> right. You know, some people do this and you know, if you can get away with it, if people will indulge you, you know, but it's not, you're not really dealing with reality because states control surface area. Yeah, you know, they're you know, and they've got a whole, you know, they've got airspace. They, you know, there's a cylinder, uh, you know, it's a, you know, continental shelf. You know, these are facts. You come into the space and coercive entities will confront you and go, what are you doing in our space? Uh, who goes there? These are things you could pretend don't occur, but I don't see why you would. I don't see what it accomplishes other than, again, it's the kind of thing a spectator can do. If you're not involved and you're just spectating, you can go, you know what? I refuse to you know, call LeBron James LeBron James because I don't like him. I'm just going to call him LeBum James because I don't like him. You know, there are fans of basketball who do this. It doesn't really accomplish anything. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, that was kind of like a big surprise question, and I really appreciate all the time you've already given me. So let's wrap it up here, and um, I'll – 
put everything in the show notes that links to your work so that, you know, more people can uh, think better after reading it. All right. Thanks, thanks for coming on. It's been fun. Likewise.